All right. Hi, welcome in. All right, we're just getting started now. Let me close that door up, and then we'll jump in. Today's advanced cameras. Give me one moment. everybody for joining me today and coming on in. Today is going to be Advanced Cameras. My name is Saxon, your host. Let me get this set up on the presentation. So yeah, we'll be talking about Advanced Cameras today. Um, really what we're looking at with this class today is just learning more about the process of editing our photos. It's kind of the next step in what to do. Um, so the way that I look at it is that you've taken the photos, you've used the camera, you've learned the features, you've You've gotten a better understanding for how to use and, and play with the camera, uh, but now we need to know what to do with our photos after we're done. Um, so we're, that's really what we're going to go into. At the very end, too, I've talked about different accessories and different parts of content creation. Now we're going to take a little bit more of a deep dive into it. This is, shouldn't be a very long class, but again, if anyone has questions, feel free to chat, and if any questions come up, feel free to ask as we're going. So without further ado, Let's start with JPEG or RAW. What's the difference and what is it? When we think about a JPEG versus a RAW, there's a couple different things to think about, but the primary thing right now is that when we take a standard picture, it's gonna come out as a JPEG. Um, that's going to be the standard file that it comes as. Uh, JPEGs are usually what we would call a compressed file, meaning that the information inside the file isn't expanded. Um, therefore, detail, things like saturation, color, hue, um, your, kind of your color gambit, uh, your ability to find those finer details, those are all things that are a little bit more flat. When we look at the middle image, we can see that while the color and everything else looks good, um, it doesn't necessarily pop off of the page. Now, however, though, when we take a picture with the raw format, or the raw file type, we can see that it looks flat. It looks not um, as crisp. It doesn't look like it has a developed color palette. What we're seeing there is the raw photo before it's been edited and changed. And that's where if we move from there, we can move into the process raw all the way to the right side. And we can see things like the darkness of his shirt, the black color stands out a lot more. His skin tone, the rose in his skin shows a little bit more too. The shine from the guitar, that deep uh, leather color on the guitar strap, the reflection in his sunglasses, those are all things that pop off the page more as we compare those to a JPEG or a RAW. So when we actually take the time to edit our photo and make the changes on there, we can take something as simple as, uh, you know, this gentleman playing the bass, and we can turn it into something that has more color, has more saturation, just has more life to it. Really the big differences that we're looking at when we actually break down JPEG versus RAW is that, number one, compressed file. Because it's a non-compressed file, the RAW, when we edit stuff on the photo, we actually make significant changes, and we can see those changes as we're editing. It's not just kind of a, a light comparison. We can physically see the difference. And as you look at the image from before, you can see the difference between your standard JPEG and a processed RAW. Um, the proof is there in the image quality. Again, the image is the same, nothing's changed there except that color and that detail is really what comes off the uh, page and that's what you're getting with an uncompressed file and your ability to edit that now when we look at that though we have to keep in mind that while the raw has more to play with that also makes the raw a larger file size so a standard jpeg should be about two to six megabytes in photo size it can obviously be larger depending on the camera you have but if we're shooting with a RAW, then we're looking at double to quadruple the amount of uh, megabytes being used. So keep that in mind with your photography if you have a lower gigabyte SD card. If you're shooting RAW, you might want to upgrade into something that has more storage on there uh, just because it can burn out or it can be used up much quicker uh, when you're shooting on RAW. 
Now, with it being uncompressed, with it having a larger file size, that also means that it has a higher color bend. So when we look at something like the JPEG, we have an 8-bit color rating on there, which gives us a good amount to play with as far as the spectrum is concerned. If we look at CMYK color grading or RGB color grading, we're going to see that no matter what with the JPEG versus the RAW, the RAW has more to play with. Um, when we get into the different parts of editing your photo, um, there are a lot of features that you can go through. When you're using or editing a raw fo uh, file, there's much more when you play with those dials. You will see a significant jump in saturation, hue, um, overall uh, color, overall uh, contrast, those sorts of things as we keep going through. It's a much bigger difference when you're editing a raw uh, file versus a JPEG. Now, the big thing to keep in mind with this too that also plays a factor is that if you are using a raw file, it can only be edited on some softwares. So things like Photoshop or Lightroom or Corel Paint Shop Pro or Capture One Pro, the more high-end or the actual, let's say, more um, advanced photo editors those are what can use the raw file format. If we don't have any of those, then we either, number one, have to consider buying one or subscribing to one because they're going to have the better features overall that you're probably looking for. However, if that's not something that you're interested in doing, just stick with the JPEG then because those can be edited on any full photo editor. And if it's the, um, what should we call it, if it's a raw, and you want to then just use your standard uh, file or your, uh, your standard editor that maybe came free with the computer or what have you, then you're definitely going to want to make sure you switch it from a RAW back to a JPEG in order to edit that photo. Uh, most editors won't let you. you got to have specific editors to do the RAW itself. And then the last thing too would be that a JPEG file, because it's smaller and it's not as advanced as the RAW, it can be transferred faster. So if it is a concern of you transferring images, whether that be to your computer, your cell phone, um, or you know a, a USB stick of some sort, a hard drive, definitely keep that in mind. The RAW will take longer to transfer. That JPEG, though, will transfer a little bit quicker. So now we'll move into the editing part, but we covered how to take make the pic, uh, how to make the camera take a picture. But what do we do after that picture? Now we've taken all our photos, we got our kids' baseball game, we got our vacation photos, um, we got pictures of the new puppy that we just got, whatever it might be that you're taking pictures of, now that you have the images, what do you actually do? We start by editing our photos. I think I mentioned this in one of the other classes, but these are some of the editing softwares I'd recommend. These four editing softwares can utilize uh, raw file format. And so with any of these four, you'll be able to edit a full raw photo. Um, if you're not using one of these four, you might want to research to see what editor you have and what that's capable of doing before you start shooting in raw and then have to reconvert your images to JPEG. Here's some examples of why we might edit photos. I like to show this because you really do see the contrast between them. Um, if we look at the top left corner of the gentleman and the girl, we can see that the purple sweater on the second image is much more bright. The blue on her dress is much more saturated. Areas where there's dark shadows become a little bit lighter, and we can see that the contrast between the two people. Uh, overall, it's the separation of the colors and of the two people that we're seeing that really then are more amplified in that second photo. As we look to the top right corner, we have the scenery picture, and we can see that the grass, the sky, everything has a little bit more of a dark tint to it, even though there's a beautiful amount of sunlight that's coming down, natural sunlight. And we can see the difference by just changing up a couple things on there. We're not really disturbing the image as a whole, but we are giving more con uh, light to it, which then gives more contrast between the lights and the dark colors throughout the image. Bottom left corner, we have our baby photo right there, a newborn. You can see that the newborn on the left side, straight out of the camera, has wrinkles, has not as soft of skin, harsh lighting on there. So overall, it's probably not the best picture for the newborn. 
in the edit, now we soften the skin up, we make the blue a little bit more pronounced on there, and a little bit lighter, um, and we also just overall get rid of those darker shadow colors to really make the baby's skin pop and just look very newborn and cute. And then lastly, we have our portraits on the bottom right corner. From A to C, we can see the different changes on there, whether that is just lightening up the image, adding more light to her hair color, allowing the blue of her uh, shirt to pop a little bit more, and then the last thing on the photo, just changing up the actual structure and lightening up the skin and the face a little bit. So the reason we edit photos is not because we took a bad picture or because we're trying to make a bad picture a good picture. It's to take something that we already have and make it even better. That's the idea behind editing photos. Some people do it, some people don't. They leave it straight out the camera. That's for you to decide, but these are my tips and tricks when I edit photos. This is the process I go through with them. So first thing I start with is cropping and cleaning my image. I start by straightening the alignment of the photo. After that, I go through and make sure that I have uh, that I don't have any excess negative or dead space and I spot clean during this time too. So in the left side of the image or of the slide here, we have an image of a woman kayaking. Um, you have this very robust sky, you have an island off to the side, the water looks beautiful. However, the image itself might not be what I want it to be. So I might crop that in. Um, talking about the first class where we talked about the rule of thirds and compositioning, we can see that on the left side, this person cropped in on the image and then moved the woman off to the right slightly, giving more of that rule of thirds presentation on there, just opening up the image a little bit more, getting rid of dead space or negative space, uh, and just really focusing in on the woman with her kayak uh, paddles. Next thing would be spot cleaning, and we can see that on the right side here. If we look very closely to the image, we can see areas or little spots or freckles on our sensor that are a little darker than the rest of the photo. That could be debris on the lens, that could be debris on the camera's sensor, there could be a bunch of different reasons for that. But what we're going to do here is take the cleanest part of the image, so just a random part of the image that has that nice blue color, and we're going to take that color and splice it right on top of the bad spots. If done properly, this should remove the spots and this shouldn't cause really a disruption in the physical image. You shouldn't be able to tell that you took something from somewhere else to clean it up. So real easy thing to do. The other thing would be straightening the photo and typically for that straightening symbol, you'll get something like the top right corner where it will show that the image is on an axis a little bit and that we can tilt in one direction or the other to get a more straightened picture um, for our computer or for whatever it is. So that's my first step. Crop clean the image, make sure it's straight, make sure everything is the way that I want it before I really get into some serious color changing and edits. Next thing is going to be to adjust my white balance. Um, so white balance doesn't refer to the exposure of the image, so the overall dark and light parts. Rather, it refers to the color of my overall composition. I will have less to play with when shooting in JPEG versus RAW, and some editors will have presets that I can control and change, while others have temperature and tint, some have both. The way to look at white balance is that no matter what type of image you take, unless it is pitch black and there is uh, no light, no sun, no nothing, um, there will be white in the image. And that white can then be changed or uh, balanced to make sure that it works for the image that you have. Now, some people will then take that and they'll edit it further and they'll change the temperature and the tint of the image or use a different preset in order to maybe get some type of mood or make things pop a little bit more in one way or the other. But Temperature, or sorry, white balance works on a CMYK color palette. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and I always forget what K stands for. Um, but basically, we can see that when we look at the temperature and tint, the little red box around there. For temperature, we can go cold or warm, and we can move that in either direction. And for tint, we can move towards the green or the purple side of it. What we're doing there when we edit and play with this is we're taking the whitest parts of our image and we're changing the balance that it has with the rest of the image. That's not necessarily saying we're taking white and turning it into green or a purple color, 
but we're really just trying to make sure that we have balanced the image enough so that way the color that we have throughout this whole image doesn't feel like it's favoring one thing or the other. If you're outdoors and you're taking a picture, you don't want the picture to look like you just took it with fluorescent light bulbs. You want it to look like the sun was saturating your picture as you were outdoors, giving this really nice illusion of light. So, so moving this temperature towards something a little bit warmer might be a better option than going colder. As well as tint, we can tint the image in one way or the other, which will allow for things like shadows or um, uh, let's say the darker parts of our whites, those are going to pop a little bit more in one way or the other. They're going to slightly have more of a green or a purple undertone to them. Now the last thing too that we can look at is the presets for the colors. And that's where we see the tungsten, the fluorescent, the flash, the cloudy, the shade, and the daylight. So we have that chart. Some of these photo editors, rather than have temperature and tilt, will actually have the presets on there, and you can select whatever one that you want. Now this all starts in the camera. You can always choose inside the camera what white balance preset that you want, or if you want it to be a fully automatic preset where it's changing as you focus, you can do those too. Um, but let's say you've taken the image, you've tried to focus and do all your stuff, but you've got the perfect image, but now you want to Excuse me, um, but now you want to edit the white balance of it and change things up to give it a certain look or a tone. Well, if you don't have temperature and tint, and even if you do, you might have presets available, and that's what that left side looks like. Where then now you can choose and decide what preset you want to use in what section. Exposure and contrast. So. These two go hand in hand. So after I've changed the um, composition of my, my photo, I've made sure that it's aligned, it's straightened, I've cleaned, I've cropped it, and then went through and made sure my white balance was where I want it, and that the color that I get of the overall image mixed with those white colors look perfect or look at least on par for what I want the color scheme to be. Now I can play with exposure and contrast. So exposure plays on the brightness and the darkness of a photo. Beware of making a photo too bright because they can get muted and muddled, uh, or a muted or a muddled look to your photo. Can I offer you a warm up? Um, exposure is important. It, in my opinion, really does help the image bringing it lighter or darker. And a lot of the times when we shoot, we don't think about that, but this is a nice way around it. We are not necessarily changing our ISO, but what we are doing is changing the overall's composition's exposure with light as the main factor. It is very similar to if you shot with film. This would be the process of you running your image through an enlarger and getting it printed on paper. When you're doing that, you typically will use the piece of paper, burn the image in, move it over to your wash tanks, and then wash the image thoroughly, so that way all the emulsion and everything is set on the photo. In that way, you would basically hold the photos in larger over the photo, and you would under or overexpose it. Underexposing it would give you a darker image, overexposing it would give you a lighter image. It didn't necessarily play with the settings you already had built into the camera, but it did play with the image overall, its darker light value. So in this case, that's what exposure is doing. If you take a picture and it, let's say it looks too overexposed, well then maybe we can underexpose the image slightly and get us something a little bit darker, but that seems a little dark, so now we want to move up a little bit more. So keep that in mind. If you're taking a picture and you really like the way it is, you've done all the other steps prior to this, which is the cleaning, the cropping, the um, smudging on there, making sure things are straight, you've gone through and changed the white balance. Now it would be important to play with that exposure. Make sure that you have the photo at the exact lightness or darkness that you want. Moving then into contrast, it's a little different, but in contrast you're playing with the darks and the light tones. High contrast makes the image start with very dark and light sections. Low contrast will make things look flat or washed out. The goal is to aim for somewhere in the middle. 
And we can really see that on the left hand side. If we look at the bottom left image, the before part looks awesome. You've got these cool mountain peaks in the distance. It looks colorful, it looks organic, um, but it doesn't necessarily have any extra dramaticism. As we move to the right hand side of the mountains, we can see how much more intense that sun is that's coming through, how much darker our actual mountaintop is with the with the light, excuse me, with the light breaking through and actually hitting the mountain side. Those are all things that we're able to change and edit through playing with the exposure and the contrast, in this case specifically the contrast. When we look at the middle image though, this is where we're going to see both play a factor. So we've used exposure to lighten the image up, and then we've played with contrast to really show the difference between areas like the cracks and the rock, or my personal favorite, the water on the bottom of some of these stones, where you can really see the difference between light and dark. Um, playing with those two features in the editors should give you a little more of a control over the image as a whole, and we are now winding down to the last couple steps when it comes to editing our photos. First thing I'll talk about though is what is a histogram? So a histogram isn't always needed when editing photos, but a histogram is a great way to see how light is distributed throughout the image. Typically in a normal or a more, let's say, average uh, histogram, this is typically what it will look like. You'll have the mountain in the middle, that's for midtones. Your midtones should be the highest when you take a picture. When you really think about it, midtones are going to be that middle ground. They're everything that isn't a highlight or isn't a shadow. In this case, we have a lot of highlights, uh, or a minimal amount of highlights, and a decent amount of shadow, but nowhere, nowhere near as much as midtones. The reason you see it that way is because midtones are going to be the more dominant part of the photo. Shadows will be the secondary one because when it comes to taking photos with midtones involved in there, there will be a section of shadows that really pops as well too. And then highlights is last because a good picture shouldn't be overly highlighted or overly white. Some examples of that, we can see the exposed pictures. So my properly exposed picture shows more on the white side, less on the dark, but the most being in the uh, midtones. On the left side for overexposed, we've got everything in the white side and nothing really underneath. That would be too washed out. And then on the right side, we have underexposed, which is very dark in certain sections of the image. And we're not getting a lot out of the image as far as the water or the beach goes. As far as the storm is concerned, it all looks very doom and gloom. Now, while that center box has a perfect histogram, the four images on the right show that not every histogram looks the same. And when we're taking an image, that it doesn't necessarily matter um, really what the histogram says. Some people prefer to look at it because it's a really nice indication of what you're doing and, and how the camera's reacting. However, these four images on the right side clearly show off what can happen when you don't listen to that. So you've got something like the top left, which is pretty close to accurate as far as the um, uh, histogram is concerned, as far as the three main areas that you're looking at, your midtones, your shadows, and your highlights. However, when we look at things like the bottom corner, we can see that most of the um, histogram is over in the black, or in the shadow side. So it makes it darker. Overall though, the image itself looks really nice, really clean. When we look at the image on the right corner, we can see the dandelion center, we can see that it's mainly white. However, when we look at the image, that shouldn't really bother anybody because you've got really nice detail, but you're primarily going to be in the highlights category. Same thing for the top right corner and the uh, uh, top right corner. You've got mainly in the dark section, that would be the trees behind everything. You've got a little bit in midtones and then really nothing in um, highlights. So that is really what you're thinking about 
when you're looking at an Instagram? Is it needed? Not necessarily, but is it a good tool to really break down how light and uh, um, you know the information that you're seeing as you take a picture is breaking it down and how the camera is fully functioning? No, I think it's a great tool to have and it helps you, the shooter, figure out exactly what my camera is doing for me and what I'm physically controlling. Next thing we're going to do is look at vibrancy and saturation. So vibrancy will increase or decrease the color intensity in brighter photos throughout my image. Um, with vibrancy, if we look on the right side with the dog looking at its nose, we can see that the original one has beautiful color. There's a little green in the fur. You've got light brown, tan. You've got nice saturation in the physical fur. If we go plus 100 on vibrancy, we can see how much more pink the tongue becomes, how much more orange the eyes become. Um, the brown parts of his fur, those look a little bit darker too. But then when we move up towards the zero uh, vibrancy, we can see how muted everything is. The tongue no longer has that color. The skin or the fur looks more black and white. We don't get those brown and green undertones out of it. And, but the eyes are still extremely expressive. have great color. Those are the types of things that you're going to get out of vibrancy. It's going to take the brightest parts of your image and increase or decrease the intensity of color that we see. And the other nice trick is looking at the tongue. You can see how much more pink the tongue becomes as that vibrancy gets picked up. Saturation, on the other hand, will increase or de decrease color throughout the whole image. So if we look at something like the bottom left corner there, we can see that the original picture didn't show off the sky, uh, didn't show off the green hills. It looks very plain and simple. However, just by editing and changing a couple things, we get more color and more vibrancy and saturation mainly out of that skyline. We can see the beautiful colors, the, the whole rainbow is represented on there. And then the fields of green are also extremely bright and, um, I don't want to use disorienting, um, but they almost look fake. It's those little details between vibrancy and saturation that can really help push your image a little further. And then adjust the sharpness. It's one of the last things to do after you edit and take other parts of your image. Sharpness will bring in, uh, bring out definition and depth of field within the images. Too, uh, too much will create a halo effect around the image. So, we look at the frogs. You can see the frog on the right has more detail than the frog on the left. They're the same image. It's just the fact that because we raised that, um, um, image and we, uh, sorry, we adjust the sharpness for that image and raise it upwards, we can see more of the detail on the skin of the frog. Um, same thing with the, with the uh, fox there too. As we look at the fox, we can see that the color and the actual texture of the fur has sharpened and become a little bit more intense, if we will. But if we can follow these few steps, then we can get into the next halves of the photo process, which would be displaying the image. Now, if you're using a crop sensor camera, something that's ASPC, I would definitely say that the only seven that you should be printing is that top row. Four by six at the smallest, 12 by, or 10 by 12 at the biggest. Those are all good sizes for um, what you're trying to do without necessarily getting um, ahead of yourself. If you have a crop sensor and you want to print something like a 20 to 24, a 16 to 20, my only issue with that is because you have such a small sensor, if you go to print, it might come out blurry or just that won't look right. If you have a full frame camera, then feel free to print any of these. It doesn't matter what you choose. Um, and if you don't have either of those and you're not looking to print your images, I might recommend a digital photo frame. They're fantastic, um, huge holiday item for friends and family. But what's cool about it is that you can display a bunch of images on there and have it swipe through and you can look at those all day throughout your home. So a great thing to look at, especially if you're you know, wanting to do something with your photos but you don't necessarily have any other way of doing it. Okay. 
Now, this is where we get into videography a little bit, um, and then we'll talk about some accessories. But with videography, it's becoming more and more popular and prominent within the photo and the filming world, only because now people are considering themselves their own content creators. These are for the people that are starting up their own YouTube channels or their own um, Facebook marketplace channels or uh, their own just productions in general where they themselves are taking the full ownership of what they're doing um, or they're trusting someone else to do it. Um, and these are the steps that you would take with that. So pre-production, that's the initial steps to beginning making your project. If you are in pre-production, this is you scouting for locations, this is you collecting materials and getting things set up. Um, this is basically you doing everything that you need to do prior to then going and doing the main filming of the production, which would be number two. Main phase of capturing clips or films to use. So this would be perfect if you're someone who now you've gone through the initial steps of pre-production, you've decided um, exactly what you're doing, where you're doing it at, but now it's time to actually get those clips and everything else ready. How do we do that? We now go and we shoot, we go to location, we do everything that we set up in pre-production, and now we actually kind of take full control over it and then get it all done. Now once that's done, we move into the final step, which is post-production. That's putting it all together to make your final piece. In post-production, this is where you're going through and editing all your photo or your video. You are splicing things together. You're doing a full layout. You're getting the final piece ready. But if you're brand new to this and you're just starting your journey into making your own content for your business or maybe for your family or for a YouTube page that you're interested in starting, this is the best way to kind of go about it. If you write these three things down on a sheet of paper, um, you then can start writing underneath those what you're planning on doing that. Maybe for pre-production, I need to go to um, this restaurant in order to get a clip, and then I need to go to um, this prep kitchen to get another clip so I can show the two things off. In production, I'm going to then make sure I schedule myself so I can go to both of those locations to film. And then in post-production, I'm going to take those two pieces that I filmed separately, and I'm going to combine them together to give me the final product. Within video, the next best thing to talk about is video resolution, ratio, and FPS, frames per second. So video resolution is pretty standard. Um, the, in today's technology, you're going to have 720 HD, or standard definition if you will. You're then going to move into 1080p, which is going to be your HD definition, 4K definition, and 8K definition. Now you'll hear these types of terms with TVs, but they go into video as well too because video dictates what we see on the TV. Um, but basically, it's how many pixels, if we were to take a corner of a TV, and we were to take the, um, or if we take pixels of the TV going from the vertical to the horizontal, we multiply those together and then we divide by the diagonal uh, part of the TV from one corner to the other far corner. That is how we then calculate what video resolution is. Video resolution is going to give us the ability to see the finer details or just the details in general of what we're filming. So if again we're let's say filming a commercial we're not going to film a commercial in standard definition. We're probably going to use at least HD or 4K because we want to make sure that in the commercial we're getting the most fine details and we're getting everything that we want so that when it airs or it shows, we have a really nice substantial video to show. If we're maybe recording something for Facebook or for Instagram, maybe just standard definition or the standard HD would be more than enough. It's not necessarily going to utilize all of our battery life or it's not going to utilize kind of the more advanced portions of the camera. But what it will do is allow us to save on just maybe the smaller details of a bigger file size or just more information than is needed based on the HD 4K 8K videos. So keep that in mind. 
ratio really is more of a stylistic choice than anything else. It can have some effects on the bath, uh, on battery life, not bathroom, battery life, or uh, on the physical um, kind of artistic choice of the video. But really, ratio is just one way of saying what uh, what part of the sensor that you're using. So in this case, if we look at the bottom right corner, the red is the sensor size, and that's four thirds. So one side is going to be four, the other side's three. That's typically because when we take pictures and we look at that, it's a little rectangle that's on the inside of our camera. Now, if we want a certain stylistic choice, maybe we're gonna move to a three two which will lower our uh, camera a little bit. It'll give us three on the one side, two on the other. And what that is doing there is giving us a little more of a crop factor. If you remember the days of widescreen DVDs and full screen DVDs, what was happening there was that TVs were making a transition from the square kind of tube TV into more of a rectangle format. So full screen worked for your HD or for your square TVs and widescreen worked for the newer TVs that were going to be much wider than they were tall. And that's where something like a 3.2 would be nice because you can create this semi dramatic effect of having the little black borders on your video. It might be something that you're interested in doing. Moving even further than that, you have the one to one, which creates a little box, which if I were making something for social media, for Instagram, Facebook, the one-to-one -one would be perfect because it would film in a small little box. Wouldn't have to crop down later, wouldn't have to change anything. I could, once I'm done, upload that video right to Instagram or Facebook um, to start receiving likes or whatever it is. And then lastly, 16 to 9, which is very reminiscent of the old, old days of film certain cinema methods. Um, again, it's more stylistic of a choice than it is uh, for, a f for a particular function or functionality. FPS is frames per second. So how many frames are you fitting within one second of shooting? Your standard, if you're watching Days of Our Lives or the news or uh, you know any TV show most of the time, they're going to be using 24 frames a second. That's the kind of universal standard. That's the easiest one to use. If you're going to use slow motion, you're going to want a higher count because you want to slow the video down. The more frames that you have when put into slow motion, um, the nicer it kind of appears to the viewer. So for example, at slow motion, a 60 or a 120 frames per second will add that many more squares or that many more stills to your um, to your one second. Another way to look at this, to make it even simpler, when we're taking a video, a video is a stacking of photos, one on top of the other. If you stop a video and you look at the video all the way through, all it is is picture after picture after picture after picture, and because there's movement that's being captured within those pictures, we then get the presentation of a movie or something happening or movement happening. So frames per second takes that down and says, okay, if this one second clip has 24 frames in it, these are what each individual frame looks like to give you one second of video. So if we add double, triple the amount of frames, we're going to have more that's happening within the second and if we want to slow that down or speed it up, we can, and we're going to get a really cool or more crisp video by doing that. So the more we want to speed things up, the more we can use, as far or the more we should be using as far as frames per second. But typically, I would say for most people, your standard 4-3 uh, is going to be the perfect ratio because that's going to use your whole sensor. HD, 4K, those are going to be the most typical for videos nowadays. And then frames per second, 24 is a good way to get started. As you start making videos or as you start making new content, if you decide that you need to switch and go from one to the other, you have the ability at any point in time to be flexible about that, to switch. So here are the must-haves with it. 
When I first started teaching this class, I was told that it's a pyramid effect. Two have to be good, and you can get rid of one. So camera quality is one side of the pyramid, lighting is the other side of the pyramid, and audio quality is then the third side of the period. pyramid. If I get rid of one of those sides, the pyramid can still stand by itself. But if I get rid of two of those things, then it doesn't work. So if you have ca good camera quality, you got to at least have good audio or good lighting. You can't have two bad things. If you have good lighting, then you got to at least have good audio quality or good camera quality. And then same thing with audio, you got to at least have good camera quality or lighting. So one can be, uh, one can be bad, two have to be good. For camera quality, having a camera that shoots appropriately for the content you are trying to make. It doesn't have to be movie quality, but it has to work for you and your project. Again, if you're shooting things for Instagram or Facebook, you probably don't need a camera that can do 8K that costs thousands of dollars. You probably could get away with whatever camera you currently have, maybe even your cell phone, that sort of thing. But if now let's say that you are a um, you know, professional videographer and you're trying to make a commercial for Samsung or for um, you know, maybe uh, Mitsubishi or uh, anybody, you're going to need a good camera that has good quality that then fits a different kind of platform. So it's all figuring out what am I trying to accomplish and what type of quality do I need to concern myself with as far as the camera is concerned. When it comes to lighting, I'm gonna, I have a couple different ways that we can look at it, but we're primarily going to look at the three-point lighting method. That's your typical um, lighting method for photography, for videography, really for anything. You've got a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. And then audio quality. We're looking at microphones. What microphones do I need to concern myself with? There is a camera inside the mic, but is that worth it? And should I be looking at other things? And that's really what the must-haves are all about. My example for lighting. This is a perfect example of the three-point method. So your key light. That's your main light that's going to hit the subject matter from the top or from the face. What that's doing is lighting them up completely. And then from there, we can go in with additional lights to help achieve then the second part of that, which is filling and now getting everything up to snot without having bad or intense shadow. So key light is on the top there. It's hitting our subject matter. It's lighting them up completely. The fill light is coming in on the side there. It's getting rid of any harsh shadows that would have been coming from the sides. And then the backlight is getting the background completely and it's helping us get rid of those shadows that then would be imposed with the fact that we have light hitting our subject matter from the front and the top. So if I have light hitting me from the top and I have light hitting me from the side, I create these bad, harsh lights behind me. The backlight would then help get rid of that so we don't have this awkward background to foreground separation that would occur if we didn't light them up properly. So if we're not outside, we're not in sunlight, even if we are in sunlight and we need a little additional help, this is the way that we should be approaching light as a whole when it comes to photography. We start with a key light that hits them on the main, the fill light that hits them from the side to get rid of those side shadows, and then the backlight that gets anything behind them so we don't have the stark light coming down from the other two. Alternative methods of light, you can get an on-camera flash that's great for photography. Um, LED light blocks, those are really popular nowadays. They can switch to RGB coloration. You can even do it where they have a warm and a cool tone on there, which is really nice. And you can also look into ring lights. Those became extremely popular during the pandemic. Um, they still are popular for vloggers and online personalities. Um, great resource to have there. Um, my one thing with the ring lights is that when they're on, they'll sometimes create this ring glow in your eye that's very noticeable on camera, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Microphones. So, again, we talk about lighting, we talk about then the mic quality next. All cameras have an in mic camera. That camera, or that, sorry, in, that microphone on the inside of the camera is going to be bad. 
It's like if you're buying a new TV nowadays. When you buy the TV, the TV is great for the picture, for the quality. As far as the actual sound of the TV, it's usually lackluster. It doesn't really sound that good. So people buy a sound bar to put underneath their TV. It amplifies the sound. Microphones fall in that same category. My personal recommendation is typically an on-camera microphone. That's a great way to get started with it. Um, latches right on top of the cold shoe mount, plugs into the physical camera. It is an omnidirectional microphone, so depending on where I'm pointing it at, that's the sound that it's gonna pick up. It will pick up re reverbs and reverberation coming from the sides of the microphone. However, wherever I have that microphone pointed, that's gonna be the main thing that it's picking up. If you need something more fancy or more direct, a wireless microphone is great. This kind of receiver attaches to the camera. The microphone then can go on anybody that you want. And even if you're not recording them, let's say I'm recording something else around them, the sound I'm picking up is all gonna come from their microphone that they have on them. Boom mics are also wonderful. Again, depending on if you can't use an on-camera mic or a wireless mic, if you have a boom mic that's positioned over someone's head, that usually can then help pick up sound. Or a lav mic, which is really great. Very similar to the wireless mic configuration. This would get plugged into a receiver of some kind, and usually it gets run up and down shirts. Usually you hide it so that way nobody can see it, and there's a little microphone that then sticks out that you're able to then speak into. Next thing we'll talk about is stabilizing your shot. And this is where then we wind down for the class. So when we're taking pictures or videos, a lot of the times people will have shaky hands. And with that, if we move or we shake, we're not going to get the image or the uh, clarity for the image that we're looking for. So tripods, those are the first thing. These are mainly for photography, but at the very end there, you see that we have a video tripod. What makes all of them different, a monopod has one leg. Usually it's one stick that comes down. You can put attach your camera to it. Great for hikers, travelers, people who don't want something heavy to lug around with them. You can let, you know, kind of land it into some rocks or wedge it into the rocks, and then from there, you can get your position. Still can be a little rocky and shaky. However, though, without needing to necessarily bring the bigger tripods, it fits a little bit more comfortably in, in packs or in bags. Moving into then the still photo tripod or a ball head joint tripod, typically it's signified by that because it has a ball point, so it's got a little bit of a wedge that's in there with then the head sticking out. That gives you full rotation, so you can go 90 degrees, but then you can rotate to get the image that you're looking to get. Once you've got it where you want it, you can lock it into place and then take your photo. You've got the stability of a three-legged tripod, which is really great. And then a video tripod. Video tripods are usually different. They have a, a stem of some sort. That stem then gives you the ability to control things like your panning or your tilts. That's great for videography, especially if you're capturing things like a baseball game or a wedding or an event of some kind and you need that stability. The legs are thicker and heavier so that way it can't be knocked down easily. And then some of these models will even have wheels on there, which then can help you move, especially if you have a smooth surface and you need to roll around. So those are great options as well, too, depending on what it is you're trying to film or capture. Lastly, we have gimbals and stabilization. Gimbals are going to lead into the way that we stabilize our camera to get the shot that we're looking to get. Single-handed gimbals will look something like this. You can use two hands, you can use one hand, but the idea is that it's more of a, what you'd call, run and gun kind of method. You hold it in one hand, you're able to walk and move with your gimbal to get a smooth, steady shot. The gimbal works on three different rotations. It has its tilt, it has its pan, and then it has its roll capability. And those three things combine together to give you a, gyro, uh, a gyroscope kind of um, methodology with it. So that way, let's say you have to move your hand vigorously in one way or another. The camera, in theory, then should stay perfectly still. 
So if this is where my camera's at and I'm moving, it doesn't matter which way I go back or forth, the camera is going to pan, tilt, or roll to keep itself directly in the center. Great for people who are making videos or content and they're constantly moving or doing things. Offers a lot of stabilization without needing to get too fancy. Now let's say we need to get more fancy and we need something a little more advanced. We have a two-handed gimbal, which offers even more stabilization. You can hold with two hands like you're driving a car and you're able to then switch and maneuver yourself. The only problem with a two-handed gimbal is now this is usually where a second person is then needed to control and make sure that what you're getting on the screen is what you actually want to get. And then lastly, you have your body gimbal or stabilizer vest. I've worn one of these as a, a, for just for fun. Um, I've never actually really used it professionally. But basically what it is, it's a device that loops around you, has a stick that then comes over the top, and the camera then hangs from that. If you let go at any point in time, the camera stays perfectly with you. But because this is attached to a larger pulley system on your body, it offers some of the most, um, the most stabilization you can get out of all three. Is it necessary? Probably not, not for most people. Uh, but however, is it something that you can add if you're having issues with video or with the stabilization of your shot? And absolutely, it's a great thing to add. And then the last thing I'll talk about real quick is setting the gimbal. Um, they really don't have too much to them. However, though, if you're using different configurations of both camera bodies and lenses, you're going to be required to stabilize your gimbal every single time. And you should probably do that either way. Um, the three main things you're configuring are the three things I've talked about the whole time. The ability to pan, the ability to tilt, and then the ability to roll, um, or sorry, roll is what I should say. Those three features on there are things that you need to be setting every single time. That's what makes sure that you have fluid motion when using the gimbal. And the last thing with it is that if you're buying a gimbal or you're just getting into the stabilization game, don't just buy the product and then take it out the day of when you're ready to shoot. It takes some time to get used to, so practice with it. Fluid motions, movement of walking while you're using it. It might seem simple, but if you can practice these out prior to you going to a shoot, you're going to be that much more, number one, looking professional, but then number two, better off because of how complicated these can be for beginning users. So keep that in mind with the kids. And I believe that's all I have for you. So next Thursday, we don't talk at all about mirrorless DSLR cameras. Next Thursday, we're going to talk about things like drones, GoPros, 360 cameras, camcorders, other pieces that we can add that go beyond our traditional camera that move us more into that content creation and that more like making space. That'll be next Thursday. And then after that, we'll go right back into intro to cameras for the first Thursday of April. But that's all I have for you. Yeah, when you say first, and when you say you put in the first page, mm -hmm. you say uh, different, different companies. Different companies. Yes. So for editing. Yeah. Yeah. So for editing your photos. This one. Uh huh. Where can I get it? Is on the computer. Computer. So. Um, if you're doing Adobe, they have a program you pay monthly for them, but you can get things like Photoshop and Lightroom. Capture One Pro and Corel Paint Shop Pro, you buy them one time. They're usually two or three hundred dollars for the program. And then from there, any photo or video you're taking on the, on the camera, you can upload onto here and you can then edit and go through and do all the things that we were just talking about. So the tint, the temperature, the white balance, the saturation, the hue, the sharpness of the image, cleaning and cropping, all of that is available through those softwares. Yeah. The, the first right, the right, the top, the right side. Any of them. Any, any four of these. Any. any of these. It's just some people like different ones. What I usually recommend is if you go online, go on YouTube, look up what people have to say about these, and they usually show videos of them using them. See which one speaks to you the most, which one you'd like to use. I'd say the most popular is always going to be Adobe. 
Uh, Adobe gets the highest ratings. Everybody knows Adobe. They've been around for, I want to say, at least 30, 40 years now at this point. Um, but the only downside to them is that they do it where you pay monthly for their services. You can't just buy them outright. And that's why people like Capture One Pro and Corel Paint Shop Pro became so popular because it's a one-time payment and then you own the application. So it's not a monthly fee. No, not today. Usually the advanced one, it depends. I get a lot of people online who will sometimes watch, but in person it's always a little daunting, I think, the advanced one. Um, so some people stay away. But yeah, I'll be here next Thursday if you guys want to come. Next week we won't be talking about any uh, about your camera at all. We'll be talking about the beyond the traditional stuff. So not an issue, not an issue if you can't come, but thanks for coming. I appreciate you guys. Another thing about the features. They have any program where we can save in the pictures and we don't need to have all the pictures that I hear about the pictures of my phone pictures. Yeah. And I don't want to transfer from my video. Yeah. How can they have any program? Like to tra transfer all of them? You don't have to transfer all of them. You can select which photos you want to transfer over. So you don't have to transfer every single one. The easiest way to do it is when you take that SD card out and you put it into the computer. Just select the pictures you want, move those over, and then you can delete the other ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the easiest. But yeah, you could go through and select which ones you want, but you never have to transfer all of them. Same if you're using the phone app. Um, in the app, you can then look through to see what photos you took on there, and you can select each one that you want to then transfer over so it doesn't do all of them. Yeah, of course, guys. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. Have a good one, guys. Be safe. Well, it doesn't look like anybody online has any questions for me, so I'm going to sign off for the day. Thank you again for joining me. My name is Saxon. Um, I'm here every Thursday for our camera classes. Um, next Thursday, again, is Beyond the Traditional Camera. So we'll be talking about things like GoPros, drones, um, anything from DJI, uh, Insta360, camcorders, that sort of thing. Oh, excuse me. And then uh, next week, we or the week after that, we'll be doing our first Thursday of April. So we'll go right back to camera, um, uh, basic cameras or beginner camera class. So everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for coming. And I will see you all next week for Beyond the Traditional Camera. As always, keep shooting.